Thank you so much, Father Byron, for that wonderful presentation. I'd like to introduce our two panelists. Um, first, John Mazzoni is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Newman College. He specializes in moral and environmental philosophy and has published articles on metaethics, evolutionary ethics, environmental ethics, Franciscan philosophy, and teaching philosophy with music. His work has appeared in many journals, including the Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies, The Philosopher's Magazine, Teaching Ethics, and Environmental Philosophy. His first book, Ethics, the Basics, was published in 2009 by Wiley Blackwell. Joan Polliner Shapiro is Professor of Educational Administration at Temple University's College of Education and President-elect of the Temple University Faculty Senate. She is the co-director of an educational movement called the New Deal, Democratic Ethical Educational Leadership, and the recipient of many honors, including the Lindbach Foundation Distinguished Teaching Award in 2008 and Temple's Great Teacher Award in 2011. Dr. Shapiro has co-authored several books and written more than 50 journal articles and book chapters, including, most recently, Ethical Leadership and Decision-Making in Education, Applying Theoretical Perspectives to Complex Dilemmas. Please. Uh, Father Byron's approach to ethical leadership is framed in a, a virtue ethics model. It is a, a model of ethics which has many ancient roots. While today there are many ethical models and styles, a virtue ethics approach emphasizes a person's character and a person's character traits. Ethically, character traits can be regarded as virtues or vices. Vices or bad habits are hard to break but good habits, developed virtues, are also hard to break. Father Byron used the two examples of greed and compassion as values that can become dominant in a culture. For a virtue ethics model, being greedy can be a habit, a habit of vice. Being compassionate can be a habit too, a habit of virtue. Through repetition, certain actions become second nature to us. Performing actions repeatedly can lead to good habits. And when we have developed an ingrained habit, it can make doing the task at hand much easier, and we can perform difficult actions without even trying. Think of examples like driving a car, playing a sport, or playing a musical instrument. Now, according to virtue ethics, this kind of dynamic happens with ethics, too, in terms of virtues, vices, and character. In possession of a good habit, one's good actions can be performed more easily. Uh, good actions are seen as the fruits that flow freely from one's character traits, one's virtues. But the same dynamic is present with bad habits. With bad habits, bad or evil actions can be performed more easily. Aaron Beam, former chief financial officer of Health South, when discussing the decision to fix the financials at Health South, said they rationalized it to themselves that they would only do it this one time, this quarter. But then they found themselves doing it repeatedly. Rather than cultivating the principles of integrity and veracity, as Father Byron calls them, these executives at Hell South ended up cultivating the habits of untrustworthiness and dishonesty. Aaron Beam also says that, that the executives at Health South were not motivated by wealth. In deciding to fix the financials, they were not trying to personally enrich themselves financially, he says. Uh, they reasoned that they were doing it for the good of everybody, investors, analysts, customers, everybody. One might say that they were acting in accord with the principle of social responsibility, as Father Byron describes it, the principle that asks us to look to the interests of the broader community. Here is an indication, though, of how the ethical principles Father Byron outlined can be used improperly. Although it could be rationalized that Aaron Beam's motivation for fixing the financials was in accord with the principle of social responsibility, was his action in accord with the principle? Is fixing the financials, not only once but repeatedly, truly an action that looks to the interests of the broader community? Also, in applying these 10 ethical principles uh, outlined by Father Byron, we may want to add that what we are motivated to do in the name of social responsibility should not violate the other principles, such as the principles of integrity and veracity. 
Another dimension of virtue ethics that Father Byron says is worthy of careful consideration is the connection between one's personal life and one's public life. If it's truly the case that our individual character is a unique cluster of character traits, which are ingrained habits, then one's character is who and what one is. For a virtue ethics model then, one's personal and public lives cannot be cleanly separated since one's character bleeds from one area of one's life to another. Although some virtues seem more focused on us as individuals, for example, courage is about how we handle fear. Temperance is how we handle our desires. We should notice that many of the virtues, such as honesty, generosity, and responsibility, have to do with our dealings with others. Many excellent traits, in other words, are social traits. One dimension of all the virtues is the fact that not only are the virtues good for the individual who possesses them, but they're also good for those who have social contact with the virtuous person. If I am fair, I am fair to others. If I am responsible and honest, I am responsible and honest to others. Another obvious example of the social benefits of virtues that Father Byron has mentioned is that one who has a virtue is modeling for others, and others will benefit from that positive example. <clears throat> As Father Byron mentioned, a virtue ethics approach also fits very well with the concept of a culture. We can think of an organization as having a particular culture or character. Cultures, as he says, can be defined by dominant values, by dominant virtues or vices, just as individuals can. So just as with the social traits of a person, with an organization, there are a number of different ways that others benefit from an organization's virtues or are harmed by an organization's vices. If a company is fair, for example, it is fair to others. If it is responsible, it is responsible to others. People who interact with virtuous organizations will benefit. The flip side of this is also true. The people who deal with organizations that lack virtues and have many vices will be negatively affected. Because organizations can have character traits, the individuals who participate in the organization can be influenced by the culture of the organization, and conversely, as Father Byron points out, some individuals are powerful and charismatic enough to influence an organization's culture. And those individuals with the most influence are the leaders. So we are led back to the corner office, he says. Unlike Marx, who said, these are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. Groucho Marx. <laughs> Father Byron <laughs> calls the ethical principles he identifies as the old verities and universal truths. Knowing that there are ethical principles that are tried and true is important for leaders who, like anyone else, can be influenced by the prevailing culture, which perhaps is dominated by unethical values. But as role models, leaders can have an influence on the direction of their organization, be it a good influence or a bad influence. They're the ones who can understand what Father Byron calls the deeper purpose of business activity. And they're the ones whose character can make the difference between leading and leading ethically. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Um, this, this is very exciting, and this symposium uh, has been very stimulating. Father Byron has made some very important points in his presentation about old ethical principles of values and their application to the new corporate culture. The 10 classic principles that he discusses have relevance today. In particular, I, I really resonate with integrity, human dignity, commitment, social responsibility, the common good, love. These are principles that are appropriate for all of us. However, over time, teaching as I've taught for over 20 years, ethics, um, I've come to see that there are nuances and complexities in some of these concepts. For example, truthfulness or veracity. Fairness is another one. At home, are you always truthful with your spouses or your children? And should you always be truthful? There are times when truthfulness may hurt those we love. How do I look? says a family member. You say, terrible? Too heavy? How, how would that make 
someone in your family feel? In the workplace, would you tell a worker that they are doing horrible work? They look slovenly? Perhaps you would, but most of the time, I think we tend to be very careful about this and take into account the ethic of care. Another example is that at home, you no doubt try to be fair with your children. However, and I have grandchildren, so this is a challenge, and I have two, and I had one child, and now I have two grandchildren, not easy. However, there are times when one child requires more attention than another, and you just can't be fair. At work, there are times when someone says for, they want a special request, and you think it's warranted. Others say this is favoritism, but you say it's appropriate. Again, the ethic of care comes into play. In my graduate courses at Temple University in Ethics, I give two assignments for my students, and I think they're very worthwhile. One is for them to go home and write up their uh, code of ethics, but their private code of ethics who they are, their personal code, who they are in their personal life, with their family, with their children. Then I ask them, and I have one of my students sitting right here, and I know she knows how important this is, <laughs> then I ask them uh, to do their professional code the next week. And then they do comparisons. It is a shock. Most of them use the Ten Commandments. They come out with, with the standard ones, and, and we all recognize them. But as soon as they get in small groups and start discussing their personal codes and their professional codes of ethics, many things come into play. Sometimes there's a collision between their personal and professional ethics. Sometimes suburban issues, rural, urban, they have different ways of thinking about ethics just because of geography. Gender, race, social class, ethnicity all play a part in determining who are you personally and who are you professionally. The students seem to love this exercise, and I don't know if St Sandy does it, but others do that. They keep it by their bedside, many of them, according to what they've told me over time, and they look at it and say, who am I? And it's what you aspire to in your private life, in your personal life. Turning to the principle of participation, which is not to shut out other people from the decision-making process, and the principle of subsidiarity, the one that we were questioning, but it really is the notion of more delegation, decentralization, grassroots democracy. Father Byron mentioned these principles, and I think they are exceedingly important. Uh, in my work over time with a wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Stefkovich, who is now a professor at Penn State and was formerly at Temple, when I left to go into the dean's office as associate dean, she just took my ethics course, just took it. And she began to work with it. And over time, we began to realize we taught ethics differently. And the question was, why? Well, Jackie had also been trained as a school psychologist and as a lawyer. And it was very interesting as she worked through the ethics. And she began to realize that she was focusing on the ethic of justice, laws, rights, rules, r guidelines. We also designed together another ethic that she was tending toward, the ethic of the profession, which is an ethic that is very interesting indeed. I, on the other hand, seem to be coming from the ethic of critique and the ethic of care. Over time, as we worked together, and we worked together for over 20 years, <laughs> so it's been a long relationship. At any rate, we developed what we call the multiple ethical paradigms, and it was based on the work of Dr. Jerry Starrett. Now, Jerry Starrett was a former Jesuit priest, and he put forth the ethic of critique, the ethic of care, and the ethic of justice. But he didn't discuss it quite in the detail, Jackie and I do, and when, then we added, of course, the ethic of the profession. So, when you face an ethical dilemma in your work or even in your home life, you can turn to these ethics. For example, if you are considering firing a worker for incompetence, you may ask, what is the law, rule, regulation, as far as this particular issue is concerned? Law, rule, regulation, ethic of justice. Is the law or rule appropriate in this situation? And who made the law, rule, and regulation? In whose best interest? Uh, Dr. Duska today talked about auditors and their need to be skeptical. This is the ethic of critique. Who made the law? In whose best interest? Then there's another way of looking at it. Forget the law. Who will I help? Who will I hurt by making this decision? That's the ethic of care. Who will I hurt? Who will I help? And then, 
the ethic of the profession, which is something that Jackie and I have been working on for a long, long time. Now, in my case, um, you know, it's a, it's a question of I deal with principles, spelled P-A-L-S, and superintendents, and as well as uh, administrators in education. So in our case, we put right at the center, when we make a decision, what is in the best interests of our students. But if you're in business or in other areas, you may ask, what is in the best interest of stakeholders? What is in the best interest of shareholders? What is in the best interest, I hope not, of the Muppets? And what is in the best interest of the budget? When you put the budget in the center, when you make decisions in an organization as opposed to putting in human beings, there is a tendency to make very, very different decisions. In the ethic of the profession, we take into account personal and professional codes. We take into account the professional codes of organizations, and I know those of you in business, there are many organizations that have professional codes. We also take into account the community. And by communities, just as Dr. Byron was talking about cultures, this is, in sense, it, the concept of communities. We, there are so many diverse communities, and we need to take them into account when we make ethical decisions. I want to tell you or give you an example of how the multiple ethical paradigms play out. And I'm sticking to the clock, so not to worry. Um, my daughter served as the director of a private child care center. This was a business, a small business, in lower Manhattan near the World Trade Center. On that terrible day, Tuesday morning, 9-11-01, she was working with some of the most vulnerable potential citizens in our country children from the ages of three months to four years. She and her staff had to make some troubling decisions based on their ethical values and their love, their real love of children. For example, turning to the ethic of justice on that terrible day, FEMA gave guidelines, checklists, none of which worked on that day, none of which. And my daughter followed this up later on, interviewing other child care directors on that day. Nobody turned to that checklist, all right? Also, it was the ethic of justice, the rules and regulations that you would normally turn to. For example, one of the rules in child care is if a parent comes in and wants their child, you give it to them immediately. You give the child immediately. That's, that's a rule. That's a law. However, ethic of critique on that day. When the parents came in to the child care center, they were full of dirt and dust. They had walked long distances. There was no transportation on that day, and they were shaking. My daughter and her staff decided, no, we're not going to give the parents their ch children until they stop shaking, until they calm down. So there had to be counseling to a certain degree before they would give up a child. Ethic of care, on that day, children had to be cared for, but whose children? A number of the staff had their own children and were thinking nonstop on that day of their children. It is a tribute to the staff and to many staffs that my daughter interviewed uh, um, on that day, 9-11, by, uh, by the World Trade Center, that the staff did not leave. They did not run to take care of their own children. They stayed committed to their children. My daughter and her staff would let staff go who had children as soon as parents would take away their children. The ethic of community or communities involved not only the school community, but the parents. On this day, parents needed to be cared for as much as children. I have a wonderful colleague at Temple. His name is Steve Gross, and he does work on turbulence theory. And turbulence theory comes from the metaphor of the pilots. And I know, Father Byron, you are very familiar with this, with uh, being a parachutist. Um, and the pilots use the metaphor of light, moderate, severe, extreme. If you move the multiple ethical paradigms with turbulence theory, you get something very interesting. On that day, in these child care centers, the situation was moving from really severe to extreme the whole enterprise could crumble. But thanks to these child care directors and staffs, they kept things moderate. For example, the radios. They kept the radios on only in the baby's room. A place to cry. Teachers had a place to go and cry away from the children. 
Everything was kept to make sure that decisions were made in a moderate way so that the children would not be affected. The turbulence level, if you are making decisions, according to my colleague, it's very important to gauge what is the level, what is the emotional climate. Can I make a decision right now, a rational one, or must I bring down the level of turbulence? And if people are complacent, should I ratchet it up? So, while I think the old principles and values that Father Byron discusses are very meaningful in the workplace, I also think is it extremely important to take into account ethical decision making and how those values are used every day in the corporate environment. My colleague Jackie has worked with a business school professor and they've developed, in fact, a, uh, a very nice pamphlet for how business executives can use this concept, the concept of the multiple ethical paradigms. Uh, if you'd like to write to me, Joan, Joan Shapiro at temple.edu, I will give you uh, the various citations. So in summary, I would concur with Father Byron that the old ethical principles can be useful in the workplace. But I do think this is a good time to think about ethical decision making and use those values as you make decisions. I also think they tend to be, some of these old ethical values, a little more complex and nuanced in this era than in the past. Thank you. And we are so close to our projected ending time for today, but I would be remiss if I did not uh, offer the opportunity for uh, audience members to uh, direct any questions to Father Byron. And um, I think he will um, field his own questions if so. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like to suggest that uh, a model articulated by John Wanamaker and William Penn, this being Philadelphia area, uh, and the Quakers in general, which evolved from what I understood was a medieval philosophy that was then brought to fruition of fair price, that the vendor and the vendee each have duties and rights to expect from the opposite party fair play, and that the thing that is sold is going to do as represented and that there'll be a fair, a reasonable profit, and there'll be some self-restraint, mm -hmm. and there'll be reasonable expectations on the, on the part of the purchaser. Um, and the two, each of them, um, have, an, have an obligation of fairness to them. Now that model worked very well for Strawbridge Clothier, and it worked very well for John Wanamaker. And I would say that, that in terms of the growth of the American economy, that concept worked very, very well for a long time. Then it seemed to have gotten lost somewhere, and now we have, we always sell at the lowest price at Walmart, which I think has a very long-term harmful impact. So would it make any sense to go back to John Wanamaker's thought, or? <laughs> that's, I guess, my, that's my question. I used to go to the gallery at John Wanamaker's to get sport coats and slacks and things like that, a little cheaper than they were upstairs. The word that came to my mind as you were speaking was interactive. And there is need for more interaction. And to the extent that we can get that interaction into the collegiate years, when these principles are being assimilated and these problems are being laid out and the effort to solve the problems is being encouraged, we're gonna become more practiced in the application of fairness to price, to working conditions, and so on. Because as you know, when you go back, just review your own life, no fair, no fair. You know, your schoolyard, when you were in the fourth grade, fifth grade, it was punctuated by shouts of no fair. And it just indicated there was something within each one of those little kids, yourself, included that had an innate sense of fairness and you reacted negatively when that was violated. But then you came to work it out and you worked it out under the benign supervision and encouragement of a teacher, of somebody that was there to not always enforce the rules but at least to call your attention to the rules so that you played within the rules and the outcome would be fair. 
I don't know whether we're going to get back to some mechanism for establishing price that would reflect the qualities that you referred to from Wanamaker and Strawbridge and Clothier. Uh, nor are we going to get back to the bazaar where everybody just bargains. But some, maybe eBay is an indication of how things are going to go. But it all depends on human interaction. And we guess, I guess what I'm saying is we have to humanize the exchanges and the marketplaces and bring people together and acknowledge that they are real human beings on both sides of all exchanges. Sure. Well, thank you very much for attending today. And we are, in effect, uh, just about right on time. Let's call it SEPTA time. Um, <laughs> but uh, it has been a wonderful day. We had four wonderful speakers, six wonderful panelists. And I hope that uh, you all have enjoyed today's event and that we'll keep uh, abreast of our new institute and its work. And I would just take, uh, would like to take one final second to thank all the people who were involved uh, in initiating this institute. I would like to thank uh, Sharon Hirsch, president of Rosemont College, uh, the provost of the college, the administration, Halloran Philanthropies, students, faculty, and institute staff. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Alan. And Alan Preddy deserves our remarkable thanks for having put all this together in less than a year. Thank you. My son, my son went to a wonderful little school that went all the way from kindergarten to uh, 12th grade. And uh, so at the end of his senior year, he got an award along with just a handful of other students. And it was an award for having lasted from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. It was called the Survivor Award. So I would like to virtually award each and every one of you a Survivor Award. But how wonderful that so many of us we're able to give up an entire day on a beautiful day to sit, to study, to think about, and to work on ethics. Uh, it's been a wonderful day. I know each and every one of you will have a lot to think about over the weekend. I know I will. And it's our hope that you will all go to your families, to your workplaces, and think very seriously about how we can improve one person, one company, one family at a time, how we handle ethical leadership and social responsibility. Thank you so very much. <laughs>